Welcome to the Anachronism Podcast. I'm your host, composer Gustav Hoyer. Welcome back to the Anachronism Podcast. Uh, thanks for joining me for part two of my conversation with pianist Benjamin Harding. And we're going to hear him share a little bit of the music he was talking about in our last episode. So you have us on uh, tenterhooks with that. And my question is, can you share some, what does that sound like? Do you have some little snippets, maybe some of those moments you've alluded to, some reference, a passage or two that comes to mind that you feel really is representative of what you just described, of lists, internal meditations that are made into sound. Uh, folks listening to this podcast, may not have the training or the background to be able to hang easily onto that. They might know it at some level, but can you give us a little bit of a quick guided tour or maybe just touch on some parts of the piece and and um, and and give us things to hang hang some listening on? Yeah, sure. Well, I'll give you a couple of snippets here. So we took a minute here and uh, Benjamin needed to retool his setup. So now he's at the keyboard and he's ready to share some snippets from Liszt's B minor sonata. And he's going to talk a little bit about it. Yeah. So uh, the beginning really sets the stage for sort of this contemplation, this meditation uh, of this autobiographical, autobiographical sketch that this piece is. And listen to how it starts. You'll never hear a piece of music that starts quite like this. So interesting. And that sets up the whole piece, sort of these descending scales. Scales are just notes that either go up or go down by step. In this particular case, the scale goes down in sort of this minor fashion and dark fashion. And the only change in the second iteration is sort of how the intervals or the relationship between notes as they descend happen. The second iteration is almost darker. And so at the very beginning, you can sort of experience the torment, the anguish of uh, a person thinking through the big things, the big things of life. And if you're like me, when we begin to think about the big things and the sort of fundamental things of life and purpose and all of that, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of work. And sometimes it can be a really dark process. But as we're going through and this theme begins to transform there is hope so just before this uh part of the piece that happens where the sun just bursts through the clouds so to speak um there's this this a uh, progressive descending scale that becomes more and more bright so you'll hear this A transformation for list this is called thematic transformation where he takes a theme and he just begins to explore it and all of its kind of detail 
an emotional capacity. So the theme that was dark and dim and gray becomes very, very bright to the point where the next theme that we hear is an ascending scale or a scale that goes up. So I'll play a little bit of that. hear throughout this music sort of this dramatic changes to the point where as we're progressing through this this theme continues to change and change it becomes a love theme then it becomes this hymn almost a hymn of gratitude to to hear sort of the purpose the purpose in life so you'll hear something like this. This is the love theme. And so on. But anyway, this piece is just remarkable and goes through a journey for any musician a fugue can be a nightmare and a fugue is a piece that um, is very very difficult let's just put it that way it's very difficult and anytime a fugue is presented to a pianist we just kind of freak out it requires a lot of concentration it requires a lot of soul searching and in his particular fugue, there's a fugue in the middle of this piece, and it is full of sort of this torment of conscience, where he is just in psychological distress, so to speak, as he continues to think about his life and what it all means. Um, I'll leave it at that but at the very end we again turn to the love theme we turn to this triumph of love and for list as a christian uh, man the triumph of the resurrection which would ultimately bring his resurrection um, we hear this sort of heavenly chord pattern at the end
it's such a remarkable piece really riveting and uh you've given us a couple of of milestone uh basically mile markers here as we listen to the work how are we going to have the pleasure of hearing you bring it fully to life what are your plans to bring all this hard work and practice to normal folks thanks so much yeah so wow it would be an honor to have any of you listening to come to my twitch page where i'm going to be premiering uh for me at least this uh, a performance of this piece um go to my website for details because i can't remember the date right now i think it's sunday march 26th at 4 p.m but you can go to my website benjaminhardingmusic.com to find out more information about this uh, performance. It's gonna be fun. Uh, as you know, Twitch is sort of this platform for online gaming and uh, List is gonna make an appearance. Love it. Yeah, and it's a great platform for sharing in real time. So as we get closer, we'll sh be sharing that date and reminding folks about a opportunity to hear one of the monumental pieces of piano repertoire, one thing that you have not told people, but I'll take the liberty of saying is this is an immensely difficult technical challenge for pianists. And so this really represents uh, the top of the game. This is some of the most difficult piano literature there is, any of Liszt's writings. And uh, it's a huge accomplishment. So even the, the disciplining of self it requires as an artist for you to bring your physical body to bear on the precision and, and, and the mental acuity it takes to stay focused for 30 minutes on a work of this intricacy and complexity, that in itself is a feat. And then, of course, the music, it, as you have shown us, uh, will open, open up some doors as well. Uh, a note I want to make about the journey you describe, one of the things I've come to realize, and I wonder how you respond to this, Benjamin, but as we look at the journey of a Beethoven or a Liszt through their music, and, and they are interesting people to know, but I think that ultimately what music can do is as the, you bring this music, it actually can become our story. It becomes the listener's story. And whatever Liszt went through, he's, he's painting a picture that's actually something true of ourselves. And so when we hear this music, in a sense we're learning or we're hearing a different voice about our own experience. It's not just Liszt's life, but it's our own too. What, what do you think of that? I could not agree more. In fact, I think at a fundamental human, human level, we are all connected through this idea of story. And whether it's, you know, the pursuing of an athletic endeavor or a business endeavor or a personal endeavor, there's a story and everybody has this sort of story. And, and this piece goes through that story. It goes through that story in a unique way. And um, I think as we go through the journey of, uh, for me, learning this piece, and then maybe for the listener in the concert going through the journey with me, something is shared, something is shared there uh, in human experience and in the, in the story of their lives and the story of my life and the story of Franz Liszt. Yeah, it's amazing over the course of uh, what would be 150 plus years of time has passed and the journey, the human journey of Liszt is still the human journey of today. The trappings of the outside world may look different, but the soul is the same. Uh, yes. Just still human. Um, so with that, uh, I, I, I'm going to do a quick time check with you, Benjamin. I have a few more things I'd love to talk about, but I don't want to presume upon your time because we just came up on the hour. So if you have to go attend other things, I'm I'm fine, Gustav. I'm happy to be here. Okay, this is more... a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, this is okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, I love it. Yeah. And what I'm probably going to do is make a multi-part podcast out of this. Um, just okay. Because there's enough yeah. good stuff in here, and uh, thank and you. And I for... couldn't remember Kevin Kelly and Wired Magazine. Kevin That's Kelly. where he wrote the article. Yeah. Um, Anyhow. Okay, so knowing uh, Titanic work like this is a a fairly monumental undertaking emotionally as you've described, the inner journey that you're on is a part of what makes a piece like this so difficult. It's not enough to just execute the notes in the right order. 
but you do also need to execute all the right notes and hit all the right levers on the machine at all the right times and in a very, very intricate, synchronized ballet of hands and arms and body and mind. How do you do that? So I know that you've been on a journey and you've shared on your social media some uh, reaching out into the world and that I think you're going to be sharing more about some exercise and the disciplining of your body on every dimension. Well, the keyboard is is no less a feat of that than being on the basketball court or running a marathon. And the Lisp B minor sonata is that equivalent in many respects. What does it look like for you to discipline your body and your mind to learn a piece like this? What's it going to take to get you to March 26th? Yeah, so... Um so much i mean for for me you know i just turned 40 i've been playing the piano for a long time maybe 35 years and um practicing working on this instrument uh, away from this instrument i've been with this instrument more than any other human being on the planet and it it's it's become a part of my life and I'm realizing that I think this is why I'm on earth uh, to play this instrument. It's kind of a, a daunting thing to say, but I, I'm more and more, getting more and more comfortable saying that this is the reason why I'm on this earth is to play this instrument and to learn uh, about myself and the world and other people through it. It's so anyhow, uh, it takes a lot of time it it takes me you know from scheduling out time during the day i have a family i have uh obligations at work and, and in life uh, at church that uh, i need to attend to and so i have to schedule out time to practice and to learn this music um, and so number one, I schedule out time. And then number two, I've got to follow through. I've got to follow through with a disciplined plan of learning this music. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping to also memorize this music from beginning to end. So to play it without music in front of me, uh, without musical cues in front of me. Um, so that's the goal. And sort of have to sort of back out and say, okay, by this date, I should have this much. By this date, I should have this much. By this date, I'll play it for so-and-so. Uh, by this date, I'll play it for another person with the modifications that so-and-so says. And, uh, and, and so setting up basically a, a, a training plan, a training plan to accomplish this goal. Um, you had mentioned exercise. So I've been exercising for a while now in my life, but I've never really taken it to the next level where I have a training plan. And so my friend Phil, um, he developed a training plan that we're going to be running a half marathon in April. And uh, the training plan starts this week. So every day has the allotted training time and training effort and training pace that you have to accomplish. It's the same thing with learning a piece like this, um, is training your body, your mind, your psychology, your soul uh, in preparing for a performance. Uh, it, it takes a tremendous amount of effort takes a tremendous amount of discipline. And I think that there are many uh, ways in which we could parallel that to other aspects of our lives. And uh, so I'm excited to be learning about those as I go along this journey too. One thing you mentioned in your social media at one point was the Pomodoro, the tomato and that approach of a 30 minute bite. And uh, maybe just take a second, talk about that post and are you using that strategy uh, and I have some comments that will follow depending on what you tell us about that. 
Gustav, I I have never been diagnosed. Uh, I, I am not a doctor, but I think I have ADHD. Okay, so I think about. <laughs> so it takes a tremendous amount of effort for me to focus on anything, and so I came across this idea of the Pomodoro technique. It's a twenty-five minute on where you're focused. You're uh, you're just really really working, and then there's a five minute break as sort of a reward for all that intense focus. For me, it is hard to sit down and just think about the piano because I'm interested in so many different things and I legitimately have FOMO, fear of missing out. I struggle with, I struggle with FOMO when I'm practicing. So the Pomodoro technique has been awesome. It's been permission for me to say, okay, for 25 minutes, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to put on my, put my phone on airplane mode. Nobody's going to bother me. I'm just going to sit down and work. And I've found tremendous um, energy, energy in that process. Uh, and then in the five minutes, I'll go and get another cup of tea or coffee, or I'll run around a little bit, just get the juices flowing, so to speak, and then get back to the piano for another 25 minutes. Are you finding that it is accelerating your ability to master this music? Has it improved it, the outcomes? It has. Um, uh, along with the Pomodoro technique, I've been obsessed about uh, keeping uh, time. So really watching what I do and when I do it. And so um, not only am I, an, I, I think I have ADHD, I'm also very obsessive when I want to be. Uh, <laughs> and so, and so uh, I've become obsessed with what I'm doing with my time. Time is our most valuable resource. And so uh, I have seen a both with the Pomodoro, uh, being obsessed with about that and being obsessed with the, my time management in general, I've seen focus rise on basically every area of, of my life. Um, but yes, I have seen in terms of the outcomes, I've basically learned all the notes, so to speak, of the piece. And now I just have to put it to memory. And I've been working on it since in, in this sort of focused way, mid-December. It's an impressive feat of memory and, uh, and learning, as you mentioned, it's a big piece. So your post on Pomodoro, one thing I was gonna share with you, I had encountered it just at random through another channel in my work and you posted on it and um, as those things, those sort of synchronicities come about in life, uh, I, as I get older, I tend to pay more attention to them. Yeah. And uh, what I've started doing with my composition is very similar in 30 minute chunks. Instead of where I would go in very irregular bursts, what I'm starting to do more and more is just to make a consistent pattern. And this is, this is not a, a novel insight composers throughout the centuries have documented this is their approach a daily discipline is actually ultimately what yields great work it's not yeah um even you know and so shifting my my mo into at least 30 minute chunks the beauty of a 30 minute chunk is it's not such an, a huge investment of time that it's distorting of all other responsibilities it can very credibly fit in if you're disciplined about it it fits right yeah. in and um and i credit to you sharing that reinforced and, and it has even brought me into a, a different uh, productive cadence. I'm working on a new orchestral work and, and I'm actually sharing little snippets as I'm going through in video clips and things. But part of that's the fruit of uh, your encouragement through that post. So I want to thank you for putting that oh, out thanks. there. And say yeah, I'm, that's I'm really fun. Kind of shadowing something that you're doing in that idea. And even as a composer, it, it's useful. Yeah. And, you know, I thought... To, to echo that, you know, it is a journey. So along the same time, I was thinking through, um, you know, scheduling out kind of every moment for a while as an experiment. And I found that 
I was not sleeping enough. Okay. So when we apply sort of this idea of discipline, you know, out there in the literature, it's like, you got to get up early. You got to, you got to get to it, you know, get a workout in and go get a really nice breakfast, uh, do some journaling, do some transcendental meditation, and then you're good for the day kind of thing. And I found that I was getting up really, really early and I wasn't sleeping well. And along the same time that I adjusted my sleep patterns and by not sleeping well, I mean, I wasn't sleep. I was sleeping maybe four or five hours a night. And when I adjusted the sleep pattern, when I adjusted the sleep pattern and started this uh, Pomodoro situation, my productivity went through the roof uh, in every aspect. So yeah, just, it, it's so fun to, to kind of do research and think through all of the, all of the research and the articles that have been written on productivity, focus, what brings the best result in people. Um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned uh, sleep health and as the science continues to mature in that space, how utterly essential quality is. sleep oh, is to health on every dimension. And uh, similar to you, um, having, uh, I've often lamented in my life that as I read historical figures who managed to get by on very little sleep and lamented yeah. that I, I've just never been able to be successful without a certain quantity of sleep, a pretty robust quantity. And I've been fully embraced it. And I, and I think it's true that the quality of the hours that I'm awake are, are directly connected to the amount yes. of sleep. And I think there's a beautiful human humility in that, that we need to embrace our creatureliness. Yes. That is in some sense throwing our arms around just really how fragile and vulnerable we are in yeah. our in our personhood in our or, as an organism and act not acting like that's immaterial it's entirely material it's defining even and as you say yep. sleep we are at our most vulnerable when we're asleep and and there's a certain amount of our day every day and as creatures, we get relatively little sleep compared to other mammals. You look at yeah. our, our house pets and stuff, their sleep requirements <laughs> are, you know, they're awake a lot less than they are asleep generally. So, yes. you know, we, we have, you know, relative to the rest of the, the kind of the created order of things, we have a lot of time that we mm -hmm. can use profitably. Uh, so sleep's a big part of that. Well, so moving through that journey and, and you're learning the list, you're bringing new time discipline, uh, which is fantastic. And you're going to be sharing that list. Uh, another thing I'll share with the listeners, and you can comment as you're inclined, but uh, that you're working on a piano piece for me that I'm going to be yes. looking forward to share. Love it. And um, as a one pianist, uh, and and nowhere near the quality of pianist you are, um, I know that there's some sections that are a little bit prickly in there, a little, little tricky. And you know, I'm just curious. This is the hot take right now. This is this is Benjamin's hot takes. <laughs> I'm just curious if there's any particular spots you think like, man, that's just really, really <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> convoluted or frustrating or I, 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 I'm just deeply curious, actually, because we haven't discussed it. <laughs> yeah, no, we haven't. And, uh, you know, if this was um, December 23rd and it was Festivus, I would, you know, spend some time airing grievances. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but uh, you know what? It, this particular piece, and I have it right here on on my on my stand. It's so fun to play. It really, really is. Um, the prickly parts are, are, are technical. Uh, they're, they're technical aspects where I'm spending a lot of time with slow practice. One of the great piano teachers uh, in the world, Nalita True, um, used to say that if you learn something slow, you'll learn it faster. And so I am spending a lot of time with my metronome uh, and just playing through things very, very slowly. Um, on the first page in measure 12, uh, this particular sort of cadential arpeggiated moment, I spent a lot of time just sort of figuring out the pattern, figuring out an optimal fingering that I, I, I'm going to be able to apply in the other similar patterns and then just playing it very slowly and methodically. 
and seeing how efficient I can I can play it. Um, as we're moving, that the, the, that's kind of the prickly moment in the first mm-hmm. in the first movement. I, I know it well, movement. having having played it myself. <laughs> it's it's a real bear. And and what I'll share for the listeners is part of what makes it tricky is it's close enough to a normal pattern that right. that you want to lean back on your habits, but it's a little bit different. And 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 what it does is it's a passage it goes from the low end of the keyboard to the high end and it's changing its shape so it's not just repeating each octave up it's it's yeah. kind of compressing as it goes so it's wider spaced and it starts to compress but even that it's doing it in, in a little bit of an unusual way and um and there's just a so, couple of little trips in it that it's not yeah so those particular places like i i literally have on my score circles because i know i i need to pay attention to the exact moment when that pattern changes and i have to think okay what finger to the number we number our fingers what finger do i put on that particular change and where does that happen in terms of the beat is it on the strong beat is it on a weak beat and those kinds of things i really have systematically thought through okay how what is going to be the best optimal fingering for me um yeah well on that note too every hand is different and this is where uh every pianist as you grow in your ability you you use other pianists guidance early on but then you get to the point where you realize but my hand isn't that person's hand and there are just some certain things about the length of the fingers relative to each other how stretchy the webbing is between the thumb and the index finger Mm -hmm. how you can expand Uh, Chopin had a very peculiar kind of uh, pinky finger so he could do certain kinds of hand shapes that just I simply cannot even come close to because my hands, my hands, a plowman's hand. We're just, I just got a farmer's hand. I can't do the things he did. Um, yeah, I hear you. Oh my goodness. And you have to come up with, with tricks. So anyway, not to put you on the spot, but I'm, I'm deeply eager to hear your, your artistry and honored that you're bringing your artistry to a, a very humble work, but one that um, I hope to be able to share as well. So super thrilled to have you helping me there. And well, thank you so much. That. And, and the goal, I mean, the goal is that we will record it at the end of March. And, uh, you know, if I may be so bold, I think I'm going to also be uh, playing it on, on the Twitch channel, too, you know, and, and talking about it just sort of as a, as a, a run through for myself. I, I really need to play this piece and play it a lot. <laughs> well, and it's, it's interesting that it is, a, you know, 100, 150 years after the list or a little less than that. And it's part of a long dialogue on the keyboard that you've devoted your life to. And, and your expression of, of your purpose in the world is through those 88 keys and, and the yeah. beautiful artistry you bring to it. Uh, so we are coming up on the end of our Zoom meeting window here. It's giving me some, <laughs> some indicators. So with that, I do want to thank you deeply for your time and uh, really excited to hear what you're going to bring into the world in 21 as you've internalized the challenges of COVID and pandemic and doing a systems review. Uh, We'll be doing a touch base in the future about that systems review, how it's going, and uh, look forward to future discussions, my friend. Thank you so much, Gustav. Thank you. That wraps up my two-part interview with pianist Benjamin Harding. We'll look forward to hearing from him in March when he gives his live concert on Twitch of the Liszt B minor sonata. In the meantime, if you haven't had a chance to check out Adventure at Sea or Innocence, my most recent releases, they're available on Spotify, Apple Music, or anywhere you get recordings. Thank you so much for your support. And again, I want to invite you to reach out to me on social media and through email and let me know what you want to hear more of. If this podcast enriches your life, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, Take a minute, drop me an email at salutations at gustavhoyer.com, or you can find me on Instagram or Facebook. I really would love to hear from you and perhaps hear your ideas on how I can make this podcast more compelling for you. Thank you.